dear brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not fair. It's not fair. Maybe that thought occurred to you when you were a student. You may have felt it's not fair when the whole class had to get held in for recess even though only a handful of students were misbehaving. It's not fair. Maybe you felt that way when you got a grade that was a little lower than you expected on a group assignment because you felt you had done your fair share, but some of the other members in the group hadn't done theirs. It's not fair. It's the reality of life that sometimes people get rewarded for things they didn't do. And other times people get punished for things they didn't do. And that happens. We can get frustrated. And oftentimes we can begin to complain that it's not fair, that a mistake has been made. The people of Ezekiel's day, the Israelites, they were making that same complaint. It's not fair. Except they weren't leveling that complaint against other people. They were leveling that complaint against God, actually. They looked at the world around them and what they saw going on, and they felt that God was making all sorts of mistakes in the way that he was dealing with people. They felt that God was especially giving them a raw deal. And so those Israelites, they had a a little saying that they would use to express their frustration. Instead of saying it's not fair, they would say, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. That phrase may not have a whole lot of meaning to us, but what it meant for those Israelites was our parents have done some pretty terrible things and now we are the ones who have to pay for those things. We're the ones who are suffering the consequences of their wrong actions. Those Israelites felt that God was making mistake after mistake after mistake in the way that he was dealing with them. The reason those Israelites felt that way is because they were living at a time when the Babylonians were attacking them. For quite a number of years, the Babylonians had been raiding the country of Judah. And before the words of our text were written, the Babylonians had even conquered the city of Jerusalem. They had plundered all of the riches. They had taken 10,000 inhabitants of that city into exile in Babylon. And so those Israelites, they looked at, at what had happened. And they thought, this isn't fair. They thought about what previous generations had done how their parents and grandparents had offered human sacrifices, had closed down the temple for worship, things that they hadn't done. And so those Israelites thought, God's justice has missed its mark. It's come a little bit late. God should have been punishing our parents and our grandparents rather than us. God's response to those Israelites was to say this, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father, as well as the soul of the Son, is mine. The soul who sins shall die. And yet God's answer was more than just reassuring and asserting that he would punish those who were guilty of sin. He went on to explain, when a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. For the injustice that he has done, he shall die. Again, when a wicked person turns away from the wickedness he has committed and does what is just and right, he shall save his life. Because he considered and turned away from all the transgressions he has committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is not just. O house of Israel, are my ways not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, declares the Lord. Those Israelites weren't exactly the innocent victims that they imagined themselves to be. They too were rebellious and stubborn, just like their parents and their grandparents. The way they expressed that rebellion was a little bit different, it looked a little different, but it was still the same. They rejected the call of God's prophets to turn away from their sinfulness, to turn away from false gods. They continued to hold on to those false gods and continued to do things that broke God's law. Still today, people 
can have the same complaint as those Israelites. It's not fair. God is making mistakes in the way that he deals with people. Oftentimes that, that question of, of why isn't God fair, or that, that, that concern that maybe God is mistaken in the way that he deals with people, that can very easily come up when a tragedy strikes. Take, for instance, when a, a young person dies, or even an infant. Isn't it easy to wonder, that doesn't seem fair, what's God doing? Why would God bring a, a tragedy like that on a family? Why would he do something like that? Maybe, maybe we ourselves haven't questioned whether God makes mistakes in his dealings with individuals. Maybe we just assume, well, God is, is fair, he's always just. But sometimes that fairness of God, it can, it can lead to some other issues. For instance, think about the disciples. On one occasion, they saw a man who had been born blind. As they looked at that man, their first question that they asked Jesus was this. They said, Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? It was just a given. The assumption they made, and they felt it just had to be true, was somebody had to do something to deserve this. And maybe that thought has crossed your mind when, when something bad or tragic has come into your life or into the life of a fellow believer, you've maybe wondered, what did I do to deserve this? What did, what did that person do to deserve that? But this problem of thinking that God makes mistakes in how he deals with people, it comes from the fact that, that oftentimes when we look at God's dealing with people, we often look at it like this. When I take off my glasses and I look out, all I see are a bunch of blobs of color. I, I can't make out your faces. I can just see some little pink fuzzy spots. In fact, it's hard to tell how many people are, are even here tonight because that's how bad my sight is. If I want to see something clearly without my glasses on, I, I have to be about this close. That's, that's how bad my eyesight is. And oftentimes, when we look at God's dealing with people, that's, that's the kind of vision we have. We've got pretty short-ranged vision. We think in terms of this world and this life. But if we want to, to really consider how God deals with people and how he treats individuals, then we need to have a, a little bit of a different perspective. We've got to have the same perspective that God has. You see, God... When he talks in, in these verses about the soul who sins is the one who will die. When he speaks about the, the wicked man who turns from his wickedness and does what is right, that he shall live. God is talking about more than just simply extending or cutting short time on this earth. Oftentimes we think of death as a separation. That's true. It's a good way to think about that. The kind of death that God has in mind is not primarily the separation from physical blessings on this earth, but it's separation from all of his goodness and all of his love for all eternity, eternal death. And when God speaks of life, for instance, when Jesus was on this earth and said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, he didn't have in mind what a lot of people have in mind when they think of a full life. I once heard of a man who, when he died, wanted to be buried in his Cadillac, and, and that wish was followed through. So he was lowered into his grave. He was lowered there, sitting into a sitting in a big giant Cadillac. Somebody at the at the, the funeral said, "Now that's living. Think about that. That's living, being buried in a Cadillac. That's certainly not the kind of living that God talks about." When God talks about life, the kind of life that he's concerned about is life that enjoys all of his goodness and all of his blessings and all of his love for all eternity. That's life. You see, God, as he deals with people, as he deals with them as individuals, he has an eternal perspective that he looks at things. For instance, before those Babylonians invaded the land of Israel, before they, they plundered that city of Jerusalem, before they brought all that devastation on that land, God said through the prophet Isaiah, 
The righteous man perishes, and no one lays it to heart. Devout men are taken away, while no one understands. For the righteous man is taken away from calamity. He enters into peace. Before the invasion of those Babylonians, it looked to a lot of people like God was making a lot of mistakes and that, that people who were faithful believers were being called out of this life, sometimes at very premature ages. People wondered, well, what, what's going on? It doesn't seem right. Why is God treating those people like that? God says it's because he was taking them out of this life to spare them from that calamity, to let them enjoy and enter that eternal life that was waiting for them. We need to keep that eternal perspective that God has in mind when we think about his dealings with individuals before we, we judge that God has made a mistake. You know, when people question whether God makes mistakes about his dealings with people, that, that does more than just accuse God of not being fair. There's, there's more involved than just the issue of fairness. Ultimately, to say that God makes mistakes in his dealings with people is really to say that God just doesn't care. That ultimately, he can't be bothered to make sure that he gets things right in how he deals with people. And yet, Consider those, those final words that God spoke to the Israelites in response to their complaint that God's ways were just. God said, repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. In those verses... God makes it clear that, that he cares about people. And that care that God has, it helps us to understand the way he deals with people much more clearly. And God says that he doesn't desire the death of anyone. He means it. He wants all people to live. Remember that life isn't just time on this earth. He wants them to enjoy that eternal life. And so that is how we ought to remember God's dealings with people, that care and concern he has for them, for their souls. Perhaps when you see someone in this life who very obviously is, is wicked, lives in, in all kinds of sinful activities, and yet they go on living year after year after year after year, and it's easy to think, well, isn't God making a mistake? Shouldn't that person, shouldn't their life be cut short for that? Shouldn't God be punishing them for that sin? Perhaps God is extending their life to give them an opportunity to repent. Maybe God even showers on them a great number of his blessings. Does that maybe to point out to them there is a God who cares about people? Maybe. Maybe they might experience some of the tragedy and hurt of sin as a warning of that real and greater punishment that, that they might endure for all eternity if they don't repent. Or we look at the lives of believers, and we see maybe tragedy after tragedy piling up in the life of a believer, or maybe a, a believer's time on this earth cut short prematurely. We ought not to think of that as some sort of punishment from God. God has cursed that person because of something they did. No, there, God is even still working a blessing for that person, calling them early to enjoy that everlasting life. That care that God has for people's souls. That is what drives his governance of this world and his interaction with us as individuals. It's not fair. I suppose that that complaint, in a certain sense, has some truth when we talk about not. It certainly doesn't have any truth if we're going to, to assume that God makes mistakes in the way that he deals with people. And yet, in another sense, it isn't fair. It isn't fair that God should send his son to die on the cross for sinners like you and me. It isn't fair that God should be so gracious as to call people to repentance, people who have broken his law, and to hold out to them the hope of everlasting life. It isn't fair 
that God is so gracious in the way that he deals with us as human beings. And yet that gracious working of God to call to repentance and to give eternal life, that is never a mistake. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. We'll join with Christians globally to confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. They're found on page 31 in the front of the hymnal. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, 